Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Julie Broad about enhancing your professional branding through thought leadership. Julie Broad, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thanks for having me. It is a pleasure to be with you. I'm super excited to have a fun conversation around thought leadership. You're in the publishing space, and so you're going to give us all sorts of ideas and insights and tips and tricks on how we can enhance our personal branding and our uh, professional branding through thought leadership. As we get started, I wanted to share Julie's bio with everybody. Julie Broad is founder of self-publishing services from Book Launchers and Amazon, overall number one best-selling author. She knows what it takes to successfully self-publish a book. Julie's titles include More Than Cash Flow, which topped Amazon, The New Brand You, and her latest book, Self-Publish and Succeed. An expert on writing a book with marketing in mind, Julie teaches authors how to write a no no boring book on her popular YouTube channel, booklaunchers.tv. Her advice for authors and investors has also been featured in Forbes, entrepreneur.com, Yahoo Business, uh, CTV, the Toronto Sun, and medium.com. What a wonderful background and expertise that you bring to the table today. Anything else you would like listeners to know by way of your personal context before we dive on in? Um, no, I think that that covers most of it. I mean, people who are listening going CTV, Toronto Sun, I'm Canadian originally. I live in Las Vegas now. <laughs> so I'll just explain that part. <laughs> no, that's that's great. Yeah. And I'm, I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. You're in Vegas. So we're actually uh, pretty oh. close to each other relatively. Yeah. Um, and uh, the weather there is probably a little bit more sunny and less snowy than it is here right now. Oh, you've got snow. Oh, we goodness. do. <laughs> And we have, we have snow in the forecast for the next several days. So I think we're oh, going to have a white Christmas. That's lovely. That's, it. that's really nice. Yeah, it, it's gotten cold here the last week, but uh, but it's still sunny. <laughs> yeah, good. Well, to start off, why don't you share a little bit about book launchers, um, just how that came about, uh, why you've really devoted your time and energy into this space. And then we can get more into how organizational leaders can enhance their professional branding through their own thought leadership. Yeah, for sure. I, I started book launchers in kind of a roundabout <laughs> weird, weird journey because I was a real estate investor and I had a real estate training and education company in Canada. Um, and in that, it, I published my first book, More Than Cash Flow. Uh, and I, I thought I was going to get a traditional deal. I was like really close on that journey, uh, but they ended up turning me down after a long back and forth saying I didn't have a strong enough platform to sell books. And, and it was devastating because I had this little girl in me that always wanted to be a writer that was really excited um, that she was now going to get a book deal. But I ended up going down the self-publishing route. I was like, well, if they're not going to do it, then I'll do it better. And, and I dove into publishing. And what I, what I learned in the whole process was, first of all, you don't need a traditional deal to have a book that's going to make an impact on people and an impact on your business. Um, you know, you have to do it well, you have to do it like they do in traditional publishing, but you know, nobody's searching for Wiley's latest release. Like <laughs> they're searching to solve a problem. So if you solve a problem, your book will probably sell if it's positioned well. Um, and so that was part of the journey into book launchers was that book kind of opening my eyes to the power of self-publishing uh, and, and the power of writing the book that, you know, you know, your market better than a publisher most of the time. So, you know, you know, what's going to really impact an audience. Um, and so that was part of it. But the other part was meeting people through my education and training company who had published books that didn't do well. Like my book went to number one on Amazon, ahead of Dan Brown, ahead of Game of Thrones. And, and part of that was that the whole time I was terrified nobody was going to buy my book. So I was so focused on marketing from day one. Um, and a lot of people just write a book and then figure out how to sell it. So 
under book launchers, I took all the pieces that you need to have a really high quality, as good or better than a traditionally published book. And I put an emphasis on marketing from day one. So we're writing a book that is set up to grow a brand, to grow a business, to appeal to a specific audience and sell. And the whole journey really is set up for that, but it's all under one roof because you can't separate editing. Your editors aren't marketers, right? So you need to make sure there's a marketer watching over the editor and a marketer watching over the cover designer. And so, and that's what we do. And that's really the shortest version of why I started book launchers. <laughs> Yeah, that's, well, that's really cool. And uh, I, I'm in the academic space and the practitioner space. I, I like to consider myself as a scholar practitioner. Uh, I, I publish a lot in academic journals. I've done a lot of academic publishing, edited volumes. Uh, so I, I've had a whole range of, of uh, both articles and book publications through traditional outlets. And my experience has been, well, and maybe it's somewhat unique to the academic book publishing space, it's not like mass market, right? So you're not like getting tons of people to buy um, an edited volume on some esoteric, uh, uh, you know, research topic or whatever. Um, but uh, then I started, you know, getting more into publishing in the practitioner space. And I, I w was going down the same path you were, I, I was looking at traditional publishers, and I was realizing, um, you know, that kind of the, the traditional value add of going with a big publisher that it seems like that is diminished over time, mm -hmm. um, but they still take a huge cut and leave you with just a little bit of, of uh, the royalties. And you still have to do a lot of the pushing and the marketing for the book yourself anyways. Um, so then I started to look into, well, what would it take to, to create my own imprint with my consulting firm and uh, essentially self-publish uh, practitioner-oriented content in, in book form? Uh, and it's been a fascinating journey. It's been super fun. And I would say, you know, not as successful as you, but moderate success. It's been a lot of fun. Um, and I've been able to reach way more people than I think I would have otherwise, uh, which has even been more fun. Yeah. And it's, you know, you hit one of the things a lot of people don't know is that they think when they get a traditional book deal, all they do is show up and provide the content and the publisher is going to do everything else. And the reality is they are going to control it. Um, so you're going to lose some of your autonomy and what actually goes on the cover, what it's called, you know, even what's in it. Um, but they're not going to market it. You're getting a book deal because you're going to be marketing it and they can see how you're going to sell the book. Uh, and so that's the funny part that a lot of people think, oh, if I get a traditional book deal, you know, I just, I'm going to kick back and the publisher does that. No. <laughs> I mean, I suppose if you're a huge name, um, with, you know, then a lot of marketing dollars will go behind it, but otherwise it's kind of up to you, right? Yeah, and your indicator is the, the advance they're giving you, right? If they're giving you a high six figure or seven figure advance, you know they're going to be investing in the success of this book. If they're not giving you an advance or it's you know a, five, a low five figure, um, you know they're really just kind of saddling up to you just in case it does well. <laughs> right, right. Well, very good. So that's so cool that you uh, launched this this business and you're helping many to to find their voice and to find uh, their avenue for publishing. Um, now let's get into more about thought leadership. Um, you talk about branding. Branding uh, for organizations is important. Personal branding though is also important. Uh, so if I'm trying to brand myself uh, within the leadership space, uh, within the industry uh, to demonstrate my expertise and to either position myself for better impact within my current team, or perhaps advancement within my co current company, or perhaps moving to the next opportunity or starting my own business, right? Um, thought leadership plays an increasingly important role in a content-rich, saturated marketplace. Um, so then the question becomes, how do you really start to make your mark as a thought leader within your niche? And how can you utilize services like yours to, to help do that? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a big, a big topic. A couple of key points that I think are worth noting is first, in whatever industry you're in, everybody has the same credentials. So writing a book gives you a credential the other people don't have. And if you write a fairly niche focused book, you're now the person who wrote the book on this subject. So it's a really good positioning tool. In order to position yourself the way you want to go, though, you have to do some bigger brand work so you know what you're trying to position yourself as and how you want to be positioned. And at the same time, I want to tell everybody that, you know, your personal brand really should be based on values and 
more than like a an expertise in a topic because as I have shifted from industry to industry, I can tell you my first 10 clients at book launchers, when I put up a shingle and said, this is what, this is the company I'm launching. My first 10 clients knew me as a real estate investor. They didn't sign up because of my publishing expertise. They signed up because of my core values and my personal brand. And, you know, my first book was successful, but that doesn't mean I can make other people's books successful. So, you know, I think that it's really more about who you are at the core and then what expertise can you offer and serve the world with. Um, and that will really expand your opportunities and, and position you to do really whatever it is you want to do. Yeah, yeah, I like that. So how do how do we start to identify? I mean, I think the the niche content area, that might be a little easier uh, for us to identify, right? Because we're in the space, we're doing the work day in, day out. We might be able to see where we position within kind of the broader uh, discussion, you know, around whatever XYZ topic. Uh, what you're describing, I, which I agree with, I think it's super important to get back to values, but that may be a little bit harder to identify what those core things are going to be for us to then drive forward, you know, the, the overarching kind of brand messaging that comes out of our thought leadership. H how would you suggest that, that leaders try to do that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I don't think there's one way to tackle it. Um, you know, I kind of I reversed into it. I wrote my first book knowing that I had massive value to offer certain types of people who are looking at becoming a real estate investor. And I was really service focused, which is one of my values, right? But I wasn't doing this, like my value is service. So I'm going to write a book that serves. <laughs> it was like, you know, this is a big problem and people don't know it. And here's a book to help them solve it. Um, and so I think that you don't have to you don't always have to know your values going in, but you do have to be connected to yourself so that you're not pretending to be somebody you're not. Because that's one of the biggest problems in books that I find is people write the book for the person they think people want them to be. And, and that's not being true to your core and that's not being true to your values versus if you write a book that you truly believe in, it, it doesn't hide your mistakes. It doesn't hide the things that maybe you're not as proud of. Um, it's sharing them for the purpose of, you know, helping others that your values are going to shine through in that. But there is a fundamental difference in that. And, and really it comes down to self-work. Like, there's really not, not much I could say in terms of like a simple solution to, to get comfortable with sharing who you are. But I can tell you that if you focus more on who your reader is and why they need this information, why they need this expertise, your ego is a little less strong, which allows you to be a little more real. Well, and I, as I'm thinking about that, I mean, who, especially in the, the uh, nonfiction space, who wants to read a book about someone putting up a facade uh, and, and not being real and authentic? I, I, there's so much content out there. There's so much out there um, that I can find on any topic, uh, you know, at the, with the click of my fingers on my phone or on the computer, you, you want someone to select your book to read it, to digest it, uh, to apply it. I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, Bluer Than Indigo Leadership, The Journey of Becoming a Truly Remarkable Leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue. What some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There's no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of our problems. The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary, everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for individuals, teams, and organizations. be able to resonate with people you just got to be true to yourself you have to be authentic and you have to be a little bit vulnerable 
And if you're just trying to put up a facade to be who you think people want you to be, uh, you know, you're, you're most likely going to miss the mark. People can see through that a mile away. And ultimately, uh, you're, you're just not going to really hit with, with your audience. You're not going to have an audience. Yeah, exactly. But it's easier to say than it is to do, because as soon as you start writing, all these kind of fears come up for people. The fear, the fear of failure, the fear of judgment is such a big one for people when they become an author. Um, and, and, you know, the fear, the fear of failure is, is just as real as the fear of success. It's kind of funny to say, but some people are ultimately afraid of what success can do to their life. And so these things do come up and they cause people to hide some of the stuff that really would make the book great. So I think that's why I like to just say, if you haven't done the self work, at least focus on the reader. <laughs> yeah. So, so when you're, when you're working with um, an author, uh, one of your clients and you're going through the process of just the, the editing and, and the, the framing and the, the marketing, you're, you're doing all that holistically simultaneously, like you were describing. Yep. Um, how often do you come back to them and say, this is great, but we just need a compelling, real, raw story to go here? How often does that kind of a conversation happen? A lot, a lot, um, especially on first drafts that we, we didn't work on. So somebody, uh, somebody brings a first draft to it because people can come to us with an idea and we'll help develop it and help them write it. Um, but some people come to us with a finished first draft. Um, a lot of times they have shared too much information on a certain subject and nowhere near enough. Like they'll just say like one, a one-off sentence and you'll be like, wait a minute, like the gold is in this sentence right here. We need more. Um, and so it's very common. Um, and the trick is whether they decide to do it, right? Because we can't force somebody to, to go there. Um, and and they ha their motives have to be pure because we have had people who, who go there uh, for the pure sake of redemption or revenge or, you know, um, there's, there's other reasons again that aren't reader focused. And so for it to be a true brand building thing that you've created, that's going to, you know, whatever industry you end up in, whatever you end up doing in your career, if it's true to you and it focused on the reader, it will position you well. Um, but if there's any other motive behind it, you know, your, your own ego, your, your revenge, redemption, it comes through and it won't play the way that you hope it will play. Yeah. So let's say we, we come up with our, our good idea. We're, we're connected to our values. We kind of keep our motives in check and we have uh, good solid motives. We, we have uh, a level of vulnerability that we're willing to offer to resonate with a potential audience. We've done all of that. We start to write the book and, and now we, we are ready to publish. What is the next step then to be able to leverage this new thing that we have uh, that, that has our heart and soul in it? And now we're trying to get it out to people so it can actually have the impact we desire, um, both for their sakes, but also, you know, for our personal branding and for our career. Uh, how, how do we then start to do that? Well, while we're, while we're in the editing process, we want to do research as to influencers in the space. And we're usually looking not for that like Instagram star or the, you know, the, the high name, like a lot of people go Brene Brown. We're like, yeah, well, someday. But first, we're not going to start with Brene Brown. Like, let's start with, with other people that are probably more accessible. So we want to research who those folks are that are going to be interested in this subject. We're looking for endorsements. We're looking for, you know, people who are willing to share your book, share your message to their audience. And so that's that's the early phases is really identifying those people early because they might be on the cover. They might be you know people that are going to help with that launch. Um, and then you really keep doing that throughout as long as you wanna keep marketing the book, right? That's something you're always keeping an eye open for because author swaps, you know, putting, putting your book in somebody's newsletter and then putting it in yours or, you know, swip, you know, podcast swapping, video swapping, whatever it is that your platform is, there's an opportunity for you to get in front of other people's audiences and vice versa. Um, so always kind of having that radar on, I think is really important. And then I, I always tell people just do something every day, do one thing every day when your book is out and you'll build your brand, you're going to get the book in there and you'll build momentum. And so, you know, those things can be a post on social media, which isn't by my book. It's a tip or something, a story or something. You can share reviews from people because that's, you want to always be telling people to write reviews for your book. <laughs> For Christmas, I always put up a thing that says the greatest gift you can give any author is a review on Amazon. <laughs> no gift, no, no, no cost, just, just review, a review. Um, 
So little things like that. So posting on social media, reaching out to somebody, building that relationship, um, you know, pitching yourself for a podcast or a speaking engagement, um, you know, contacting your local library, seeing if they have any events going on. Can you add value in your local community at the library or a bookstore or a local school, depending on your subject? Um, you know, for me, it's always where can I add value? Like, just keep looking. Where can I add value to somebody who might have this this reader in their audience? And one thing a day and, and you will, <laughs> you can't help but find things that are going to work if you're doing something different every day. Yeah, I like that. So doing something every day and mixing it up, trying a lot of different things, uh, really yeah. experiment with what will work for you and be true to your, you know, your approach, your personality, your style, uh, and resonate with your audience. And that's probably not going to be the same formula <laughs> for, you know, any two people, right? It's going to be slightly different. Uh, or perhaps drastically different. Uh, another question I have is, you know, so I, I write this book, I publish it, I'm hoping to have a, a, a larger industry impact and position mm -hmm. myself more broadly. But, you know, I also want to see, how, you know, how can I leverage my own expertise and thought leadership within my own team? Mm -hmm. uh, but it seems to me that if I come to my team and say, hey, check out my new book that I've just published, everyone read it, um, you know, that's not going to work. Uh, People just think I'm an arrogant jerk <laughs> if I try to do that. Uh, any thoughts on how we can tie back into our thought leadership into our day to day with our own existing team? I mean, for me, I, I couldn't I couldn't make the whole team read self publish and succeed. Um, but you know, it was one of those things where a lot of them were involved in the creation of it. So they would read it before it was actually out and provide input, and then you get their buy in. So you know, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't try to put it down people's throats after the fact, but during they're a part of the creation and you know, you're know you essentially getting them to read it at the same time as maybe they have an idea or a suggestion or a, a process of improvement to you know make the book better. Uh, that's typically how I do it, but new team members that come on my team, welcome to the team, here's the book. <laughs> but that's my approach because I think yeah. you know, it, it's, a, it's a, a great training tool. It really teaches them all the things that they're going to need to know, at least as a foundational level. Yeah, yeah, and it introduces introduces them to you and to your values, which I would I would think any new member of the team would want to know. And especially yeah. if you write in an accessible way, uh, then it, it can be fun and engaging and a relatively you know, quick and easy way to to yeah. to form that connection. Um, that's been one of the challenges that I've had. Again, as I, I write in the scholarly space. Yeah. very dense, esoteric, academic articles, um, and then trying to translate the research that I'm doing into shorter practitioner-oriented articles or in a book. It, yeah. You know, I can't have that, that if I have a big, dense book, nobody's going to wade through that, mm -hmm. except maybe other academics that are looking through to look at research results that they want to cite or, you know, yeah. to inform their own research. And so any thoughts on on just that accessibility piece to make it um, resonate with people, engage them. So they'll want to keep reading, keeping it uh, accessible enough that it's still rich in content, but uh, it's, you know, anyone can pick it up and read it and digest it and start to apply it. Yeah. There's, there's two things. One is kind of the, the grade level that you really want to write at is no higher than grade eight. So the flesh, you know, the flesh Kincaid score. So, you know, grade six to grade eight is kind of where you want to be. Um, but if you, if you're used to writing academically, like we have, we work with a lot of doctors <laughs> and they're, they're used to really that that's how they talk almost. But um, conversationally, if you talk to somebody, so if somebody asks you a question, rarely are you going to use the same words that you write in an academic paper. And so typically a great approach for people that are struggling to get out of that is to you know, record it, either be interviewed and have someone else write it, that's option one. Option two is ask, have a list of questions and answer them as though you were telling your best friend or even telling a kid. Right. Imagine you had to explain this to a 10 year old. How are you going to explain the findings to a 10 year old? Put it on a recorder, a voice recorder, and then trans, uh, get a transcript. And then you can massage it from there. Um, but yeah, it depends. Some people just can't get out of the academic space and they need somebody else to write it. But if you can, and you're, you know, when you talk, which you're, you know, you're talking at a normal, a no, you're not using the giant academic words, <laughs> jargon, and all that fun stuff. So, I think you could just talk it out and that would be a great solution for you. I mean, some people would, would take that advice and, and run with it. Others might say, well, then I'm just dumbing it down or, you know, some, some sort of a condescending, you know, thought like that. Uh, how would you respond to that? 
Yeah, we've had that. We've had, we had somebody who tried to put therefore here too, and all kinds of funky words that were like, nobody, nobody wants to read this. Um, but she felt that it was going to make it, um, make her look bad to her peers. But that was the key right there was we said, are you writing this book for your peers? Or are you writing this for other people? And, and who's your ideal reader? And so again, it just goes back to that ideal reader, who are you writing this for? Who's going to read this? And what is their expectation or what's going to be their enjoyment level of reading therefore here too and all those funky words that she was putting in there and she was upset our editor was taking out. Um, so that's, that's the answer is, is what's your reader expect and what are they going to enjoy? Yeah, love it. Julie, it has been a pleasure. Uh, I know at the time I'm going to have to let you go here in a minute, but before we close, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about your work, your team, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Yeah, for sure. So uh, if you want to write a book that's positioned to make yourself a thought leader, I've got a resource. Go to booklaunchers.com, number seven steps. So just the number seven steps, and that will get you a download. Um, our website's booklaunchers.com as well, if you want to poke around there. Uh, and that's the best place to find me and learn about what we do. Wonderful. Thank you, Julie. It has been a true pleasure. I really uh, encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Julie and her team can do for you. Position, positioning yourself as a, as a thought leader is really important in this day and age. Uh, and we need to be thinking about how we can be more impactful uh, with our day-to-day -day team in our current role and our current job, but also uh, as we position ourselves for our future. So I hope you'll take advantage of the tips and the ideas that you've heard here today. As always, I hope everyone will stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership, ordinary everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years with increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition. The average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.